Welcome to Shift, everybody. We're glad to be back in person, and we're glad that you've joined online. If this is your first time here, you can scan this QR code or the one at the welcome table. And if you fill out the Connect card, we'll send you some free Opus coffee. And now you have the option of drinking that cup of Joe with Joe, my father. Because who doesn't want that? In person or on Zoom, you now have a chance to ask any questions to get to know who we are and why we do what we do. Right after service today, we'll be having a short meeting. Meaning? Right after service today, we'll be having a short meeting to discuss the options for our new space. So even if you don't have an opinion, feel free to stick around and see what we found. Make sure to bring in your generosity jars next week. This is our first big change dump of the fall. We're saving up all of our loose change to feed as many families as we can over the holidays. Last year, we fed 75 families, and this year, we're aiming for even more. So bring those jars in, and if you don't have one, there's a ton at the, well, I guess I should be pointing that way. There's a ton at the welcome table. Go grab one. Small groups are starting this week and shift students meet tonight. If you wanna join, you can... Yep, you already knew it. Scan the QR code. Because I say that hundreds of times in a month. Mark your calendars for the 24th because God Breathe author Zach Hunt will be here to wrap up our series and do a Q&A lunch afterwards. So watch out for details coming this week. And now it's on to week two of God Breathe. <sighs> hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, last week, uh, I mentioned that um, I had always believed that the Bible had just kind of been handed down directly from God to humanity, as in like God dictated what needed to be written, and humans wrote it, and then that's how we got this book of sacred texts that we're talking about. But the actual process of the books of the Bible coming together uh, is much more fascinating. Um, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew canon, uh, wasn't finished until, depending on who you read, for rabbinic Jews, around like the second century CE. And for the New Testament canon, uh, it didn't get put together and kind of like finalized until the mid to late uh, 4th century CE. And despite the claims of things like the Da Vinci Code, which was, is an exciting book, you know, excellent book, fun movie, there was no secret cabal kind of pulling the strings, uh, keeping some books in and keeping other books out. Um, especially when it comes to things like, you, you see it all over TikTok, it's all over social media, like the Nicene uh, Council in um, 325 CE. Basically what happened for the New Testament canon is it came down to a couple of questions. Did they think that the authorship was from the apostles, like who wrote it? Did they think it was like divinely inspired? And then was it widely accepted as those things, right? That's pretty much the criteria for how the books came in or, or didn't. So for example, the Nicene Council didn't keep out a gospel called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And it wasn't some sort of like secretive thing. It had just fallen out of favor with the population by the time the council came about. The infancy gospel of Thomas has these stories of Jesus and his childhood. And some of them are just like insane, including stories of where uh, like Jesus as a kid, other kids getting on his nerves and then him just being like, you're dead and like killing them. It literally reads like a young Voldemort. I mean, if you're Harry Potter at all, that's, that's who Jesus was in those things. Um, but I think the most fascinating story of the canon was the book of Revelation. So Revelation wasn't accepted as canon until the 4th century CE, all right? Because for hundreds of years, um, they were debating on, is this actual, should this be in the canon or not? And um, there was a debate raging at the time. So we're talking hundreds of years, all right? So for hundreds of years, the early church was debating on who Jesus was. Was he God or was he like a lesser God that was created by God the Father at some point but held high status because of what he accomplished on earth? 
So this was a debate within the early church, which is always funny to me because, you know, when you read stuff, you just read what you think into what, and like, well, of course they thought what I thought, right? We've always thought this. That's not true. They debated this for hundreds of years. And Revelation has some of the clearest claims of divinity that is written and uh, attributed to Jesus saying these things. And so basically what happened is that the side that was arguing for Jesus to be God won the debate and revelation became canon. So the whole thing, uh, and you can, you know, you can say that the, the process was guided by spirit or guided by God, but the whole thing uh, was, was incredibly subjective, which I found, um, which I found uh, incredibly surprising. So I want to welcome you all to Shift. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, my name is Joe. I'm the pastor here. And if you do fill out that Connect card, um, check that little meeting box. I'd love to take somebody out for coffee, whether it's in person or Zoom. Despite what my daughter says, we will have a good time. All right? <laughs> uh, last week, we kicked off this series called God Breathe. Um, we looked at, and it's all based on a book called God Breathe, and the author will be here on the 24th, so... Um, mark that in your calendars. That's going to be good. Dude, he's a good dude. Um, so last week we looked at the idea of biblical perfection or inerrancy and the rise of that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, and how that has paved the way, created so many problems and paved the way for so many of us to leave conservative evangelicalism uh, in the modern era because inerrancy creates problems that didn't exist before because it forces the Bible to be something that it's not created to be. It forces it to answer questions that the Bible is just not concerned with, with uh, answering. And it gives the impression that you're able to wrestle and struggle with the texts as long as you come to these conclusions that are uh, work within the framework of inerrancy. So like as long as you come to these conclusions here, you can wrestle all you want. Um, and because of that, the modern church has lost the ability to wrestle, right? Lost the ability to debate, to think for themselves, to interpret like the early church did. Now, I am a sucker for a well-told story, all right? I love losing myself in a really well-told story, right? To, um, and we all do this. This isn't just me, but like to, to, to like see yourself in the protagonist of the story, right? Or, or even to, to identify with the antagonist and why they are the way they are. What are their, their background stories? And then to see some of my stories being reflected in those things. I don't think there's anything quite like it. Which is why, ah, oh, I love Batman. But DC, which is not Marvel for you guys that aren't comic book people. Not, you know, like the Avengers, that's Marvel. The other side, Batman and Superman, that's DC. But they are, have been horrible at it. I'm just... Their movies are atrocious, and I grew up reading Batman, so this hurts. But their movies are atrocious. They're just not well told. There's like no continuity. They just flop after flop after flop. They, they don't draw you in, all right? They're not well thought out, and they rely on these old superhero tropes that are just boring, right? Take, for instance, Batman versus Superman, all right? You've got this rivalry between the two of them. They hate each other. They spend the entire movie going after each other. Batman's trying to kill Superman, and it all starts back in the movie Man of Steel, where Superman basically destroys the entire city fighting General Zod, and you see that Batman witnessed all of this and people dying and stuff, and he hates Superman. And there's this scene in the movie where Batman is literally getting ready to kill Superman, and then they discover that their moms are named Martha, and oh, your mom's named Martha? So is mine. Let's be friends. I didn't mean to kill you. Just like, oh, what? No, this is terrible storytelling. Our stories inform us. They inspire us. They convey deep wisdom and truth, unless you're DC. And if we rely, if we rely on inerrancy to guide us as we read through Scripture, we're not only going to miss the deepest wisdom and the deepest truths, but we're also going to begin to see inconsistencies that begin to unravel those stories, just like our moms have the same name thing. Uh, for instance, for example, 
If we hold that the Bible must be factually and historically accurate to not only be divinely inspired, but to speak wisdom and truth in our day and age, then what do you do with the fact that two different people killed Goliath? In the Old Testament uh, book of 1 Samuel 17, we see David killing Goliath. Go ahead and show that. It'll be up on the screen for you. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. It's a well-told story, for, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. All right? So that's the story, right? David versus Goliath. Everybody knows that story. But when you get to 2 Samuel chapter 9, or 21, verse 19, we read something very puzzling. Go ahead and show that one. Then there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, son of Jer Origem, uh, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, depending on what translation you read, there might be a little asterisk there because some translations say the brother of Goliath. That asterisk, if you follow that on the bottom of the page, says brother is not in the Hebrew. That was inserted because in 1 Chronicles, which is a later uh, book in the Old Testament, chapter 20, the chronicler came up with this inventive way of, of kind of like reconciling these two stories and saying, no, 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 Elhanan killed Goliath's brother, not Goliath himself. And that was a creative way. And the chronicler does that with multiple stories, retells them with different endings and different, um, different ways of, 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 of that happening. The overwhelming consensus among scholars is that the Elhanan story is the oldest tradition of that story. And at some point along the way, the story was changed and the killing of Goliath was attributed to David. Now, let me ask you, does the historical information showing that David may not have been the one to actually kill a man named Goliath change the significance and wisdom that we find in the story? Let me give you another example. Take the Exodus, right? If you've been in church, even if you haven't been in church, it's a well-told story. You're like, what was his name? Charlton Heston, let my people go, you know, that type of stuff. So you've got um, the, the Exodus story. Moses is raised uh, by Pharaoh's family, right? Uh, he finds out as an adult that he's actually Jewish, the race of people that are enslaved by the Egyptians. He ends up killing uh, an Egyptian soldier. He flees runs away for decades, only to end up being called back by God to help lead the Israelites out of freedom. We see like this crazy um, showdown between the Hebrew God and the gods of Egypt. And we see that fought within the 10 plagues because each plague represents one of the Egyptian uh, gods that they worship, showing the significance that the Hebrew God is more powerful than all the Egyptian gods. So Moses leads the people out, right? Pharaoh says, get out of here after the last plague. So he leads the people out. Pharaoh changes his mind. He leads his army after Moses. This is when we see that huge, that culmination, right, where Moses takes his staff and the Red Sea parts and the Israelites go across dry land. The Pharaoh's army chases after him and God releases the water and they're all drowned, right? That is the story. Uh, now, according to all of this, like if you're taking a, the amount of people that would have been enslaved and how long they would have been there, estimates are that roughly a million people, a million Israelites would have left Egypt uh, at the same time. Now, the issue with this account is that we have zero archaeological evidence for it. None. Uh, we don't have any evidence for this many people leaving at one time or traveling through the desert for 40 years. There's no... There's no Plates, there's no pots, there's no trash. There's nothing showing that a group this large traveled around this desert for that long. We don't have records, and the Egyptians kept good records. We don't have records showing that uh, Egypt suffered such a devastating defeat. And I can remember even teaching this, forgive me, teaching this that like, well, they were just embarrassed and they didn't want to keep this in their national records. Maybe, maybe, that's plausible, right? But what we don't have is um, we don't have records of the massive economic upheaval and collapse that this would have created. To lose a workforce of a million people would have decimated the Egyptian economy. And we don't have records of a dip in the workforce. We don't have records of a dip in the number of foods that are stored. And we don't have any records of, of Egypt being left without an army or defenses of any kind. Now, let me ask you again. 
Does knowing that this ancient story may not be as factually accurate as we were taught lessen the significance of the story or somehow rid it of its wisdom and the truth that we find there? Honestly, for some, yes. Yes, it does. For some, I think it does, but only because we created the problem in the first place. Had we, the American evangelical church, taught this as a book of wisdom and truth, instead of creating these false narratives of inerrancy, this wouldn't be an issue at all. We wouldn't be talking about it. Now, it does not matter to me whether you see this story as um, historically true or not, because it's not the point. It's not the point. What's the deeper truth to the story? What is it trying to tell us about us and about God, right? Uh, That God hears the cry of the oppressed. That God will defend the marginalized. That God opposes the brutal rule and uh, might of empire. Now you take this story, and during the days of abolition, during the slavery days, the chattel slavery days of the United States, You had uh, majority white pastors on both sides of this question using scripture to uh, embolden their thought, right? Their case. So pro-slavery pastors would point to passages where Paul said, "Uh, slaves obey your masters, right? And they would say, look, it's ordained. Slavery is fine. We're good. You're fine. Good job, white people, right? And then uh, people that that were fighting for freedom would, would have to like reinterpret. They had to renegotiate scripture. And they had to like have this creative reading and point to broader themes, all right? But that's not what black theologians were doing. And there were black theologians, but slavery and history have erased them. What black theologians were doing was is that they saw themselves in the story of the Exodus. They identified with the plight of the Israelites, of the marginalized and the oppressed. And they said, no, that's our story. And they saw themselves in the story of the Exodus, that God hears their cry, that God will defend the marginalized, that God opposes the rule and might of the empire. And they took the wisdom that they found in those stories and they fought for freedom. They, they escaped their, these cruel uh, human traffickers, and that's what they were, uh, human traffickers. And they used it to help bring um, strength, Uh, and endurance. They created underground railroads based on this, helping people cross their own individual Red Sea to get to their promised land. Now, fundamentalism gives us the wrong answers because it asks the wrong questions. The fruit of that tree is rotten. It produces war. It produces excess. It produces abuse. And you don't have to take my word for it. All you have to do is just look at Scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. Look at American history. Just take American history. You don't have to go past us. And look at all of the harm that's been done in the name of God. Real stories, right? You can read them. Unless you're in class here in Florida. But you can read the stories of massacre, right? Of subjugation, of lynchings of genocide, all done in the name of Jesus. Uh, This past week, um, I spoke at our school board meeting. There were several of us that were there. I'm I'm part of this uh, local committee that um, is helping the Alachua County um, administration put together an LGBTQ plus student policy guide. And that guide is there to help teachers and faculty and staff and students and family navigate uh, the current laws coming out of Tallahassee. And uh, basically my encouragement to them publicly and also behind the scenes is like, what we have to do is protect all of our children, right? Not just certain groups and ignore the other. We have to, we have to protect all of our kids. And that's what this policy is about. What it's not about is grooming or sexualizing children, which is idiocy. And I just... I love people and Jesus, but man, that makes me want to punch, throat punch people, want to hear that. Um, But what it does do is it's about protecting one of the most vulnerable vulnerable groups in our student population. So I said what I said, and and I sat down, and there were other people. And then uh, towards the end, this fundamentalist pastor got up to speak. I'd never met this gentleman, but he was very polite. He was very polite. 
He was very thoughtful in what he said, and he spoke very eloquently about the things that he, he said. He, he asked the board to pray about all of this. Um, we'll have my thoughts on that regardless of this, and ultimately do the right thing because we're all going to be accountable to God one day. Now, he sat down, and the people that I was sitting with, they looked really confused, and they looked at me, and they were like, what did he just say? I don't, I don't know what he said. Because again, right, very thoughtful and all the stuff that he said. Uh, so being the pastor sitting on the row with everybody, I had to, I had to interpret the, the, the Christianese for, for them. And um, basically what he said is that, that homosexuality is a sin, so we shouldn't do anything to protect these students. That is the fruit of fundamentalism, which is the soil in which inerrancy grows. My view is the view, and it's not my opinion because it's the word of God. And if you don't agree with my opinion, which actually isn't my opinion, you're out and I'm in. That's the fruit. And I am not interested in engaging with that at all. If somebody wants to uh, argue or debate, they can do it on their own time. It is boring to me. I'm not going to invest any emotional energy into that. However, if somebody wants to discuss, ask questions, I'm always open to that. And I'm always open to learning new things, hearing new perspectives. I'm totally down for that. What I'm really interested in is discovering the truths that my soul already knows. That the deepest parts of me, that the deepest parts of me are aligned with God and not opposed to God. That every single person, every single human is sacred. That our world is sacred. Instead of our exploiting our world, we should be good stewards of its resources. But fundamentalism and inerrancy create a God that is small, and protects our religion, protects our country, protects our race. It builds up walls and separates us from one another and separates us from creation. It creates division within the body. And we argue and we, we create entire denominations over stupid details. This is a real one. Like, does salvation take place when you say a prayer? Or does it take place when you go underwater? And, and if you go underwater, do you have to go all the way under the water? Or can somebody just pour it over your head? I don't care. I just don't care. That's so boring to me. Listen to this Christ hymn that's found in Colossians. This is a letter written by Paul. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Go ahead and show that. It'll be up on the screen. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, yeah, keep going. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdom, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled. Yeah, go ahead. And God, through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Do you hear how mystical that is? How all encompassing that is? Does that sound like a God that can be contained with our small ideas of who they are? Does that sound like something that we can <laughs> confine or explain away? Or does that sound like something that's far beyond our ideas of the sacred? Something to be experienced. Something to tap into. Something that resides deep within every person that you will ever encounter. Something that you feel sitting in the middle of a forest. Something that you hear when the wind passes through the fall leaves. God is in and around everything. God is being. God is. And that is the truest truth. That's what these stories and these histories and these poems and accounts are trying to communicate to us. And Jesus shows us how to live these things out. And your belief and your understanding of those things 
is so insignificant that it can't be measured standing next to the enormity that is God. How different, how different would our world be if the church had met indigenous people, seeing the sacred already existing in them instead of people needing to be colonized? How different would our world be if the church had met the world with not greed, but with reverence? How different would thing be, things be if the church had met the other with openness and not scorn? Our Western tradition has gotten it wrong. You cannot convince me otherwise because we see the evidence. I know this to be true because the fruit is rotten. In my humble opinion, I believe that the most important thing that we have to do is to take the Bible down from the idolatrous pedestal that we have placed it on and put it back where it goes. Hold it in the highest regards, absolutely. But not the inerrant word of God. Instead, we find that lived out in the personhood of Jesus. We see this in uh, John's account in chapter one. Go ahead and show that one through five. And it says this, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And it's time for us as a people to come out of the darkness of fundamentalism and inerrancy and into the light and life that is the wisdom of Christ. So for those that are new here or on the stream, we end each week with a time of reflection. And instead of manipulating emotion with a big altar call, what we want you to do is to check back in with yourself. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask some questions to help guide that process. And the band will come up and they're gonna kind of just softly play in the background but basically so that it's not an awkward silence. And at the end, I'm going to pray for us. And for those that are wanting to, anybody that wants to, we take communion. And that's those little cups there of juice and bread. And uh, communion for us is a weekly reminder of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So my first question to you is this. How did it make you feel when I said that the Bible isn't factually, 100% factually, historically accurate. How did that make you feel? And why do you think you felt that way? For some, that's not going to be a big deal, but for others of us, how has Western Christianity created harm by using inerrancy as its reason? And how has it created harm in you? I asked it earlier, but how do you think our world would be different if instead of seeing people as evil, as fundamentalism teaches us to, the church met people seeing the sacred already in them. Would American history be different if the church taught the settlers to see the indigenous people as children of God and not heathens? My final question for you this morning is this. What do you need to do to help you untangle inerrancy and to learn to see the deeper truths found in Scripture? So I don't do this a ton, but I'm going to just offer it up. If anybody, you know, after this or through the week, maybe you need help untangling this stuff. Maybe you need some direction or next steps. Please reach out to me. Uh, hit me up. You can text me. Find me on Facebook email the church. I get all of that stuff. Um, and let's talk. God of light, 
uh, illuminate 